Bar. Um, my name is Ryota Jonen, and I'm from the World Movement for Democracy. Um, some of you here may not know about the World Movement for Democracy. Let me briefly explain what we are. The World Movement for Democracy is a network of uh, democracy activists, human rights defenders, practitioners like members of parliament from around the world to come together to unite democratic forces to advance democracy in wherever we work. We do so by connecting advocates, sharing informational resources, knowledge, and inspiring each other to build solidarity. And we do this in three thematic areas, defending civic space, building inclusive governance, and empowering the next generation of the democratic leaders. We are based within the National Endowment for Democracy in Washington, DC. As we are concerned about shrinking civic space around the world and the MENA region, the World Movement for Democracy and the Tahir Institute for Middle East Policy has had long fruitful cooperation on the issue of advocacy in the region. We appreciate their partnership working with us on particularly around the issue of advocacy efforts to bring the voices of regional democracy and human rights activists to the international human rights mechanisms like Human Rights Council at the UN. This is why I'm so delighted uh, the World Movement is co-organizing this event today with the Tahir Institute. Popular uprisings throughout the MENA region 10 years ago amplify the voice of people calling for accountable government, social justice, and inequality. The, you know, this pop, uh, popular uprising, the protest movement is known as the Arab Spring. Many places have suffered setback since 2011. Perhaps with uh, the current developments in Tunisia, one might argue that all the Arab Spring countries have suffered setback. But the desire to end, people's desire to end authoritarianism has remained strong and it has in some ways resurf resurfaced uh, in new forms and toward call for accountability, social justice and the transparency. Young democracy activists are seeking new ways to promote human dignity and looking for space to reflect on and learn from past movements and neighboring experiences. So today's event is one of the first conversation series that we are going to have on um, taking stock of the contemporary uh, advocacy tactics in the region, learning new strategy for tangible reforms, and exploring the possible new forms of solidarity in the MENA region. And today's discussion focuses on one of the guarantor of sustainable democratic society, which is accountability. Accountability of government official to citizens, politicians to voters, security forces to laws and human rights, business leaders to transparency and legality. MENA region is a region that has suffered issues from impunity for many, many years before and after Arab Spring. Our speaker today will feature examples of ensuring access to information, exposing corruption through investigative journalism, using strategic litigation, and carrying out international advocacy. I very much look forward to learning from this discussion. And I want to actually give a big thank to our partners, Amey al Sadani, uh, Rami Yakub and Audrey uh, Bolas of Tahir Institute, being uh, great friends and uh, great partners for the world movement, working with us on this event, making sure that conversation is meaningful. And I also want to give a shout out to my colleague at the National End of Democracy, World Move Democracy Secretariat, Georgi Todorovic, and sharing a word. So now I'd like to pass microphone to the discussion moderator, May. Thank you. Thank you, Ryota. Um, it's really a pleasure. My name is May Sadani, and I'm the managing director and the legal and judicial director of the Tahrir Institute for Middle East Policy, today's co-sponsor. I'm also your moderator for the day. 
It's an absolute privilege once again to be hosting this event alongside our dear partner, the World Movement for Democracy, and as part of this larger series hosted by other close partners, the Project on Middle East Democracy and the Arab Reform Initiative. As we look to the ways that change makers, advocates, and organizers have been mobilizing over the last decade in the Middle East and North Africa, and the ways in which they continue to mobilize today, a key part of that story is accountability. Across the region, we see innovative initiatives that are holding government officials accountable to their own promises, that are bringing perpetrators to account, not only in courts of law, but even in investigative journalism reports, and efforts to use the rule of law to craft a vision for the future. Today's conversation brings together practitioners based in and from different countries and different professional backgrounds to explore, unpack, and assess what accountability looks like and how actors in the region are mobilizing toward a just future. A reminder to our audience that this conversation, which will be a moderated question and answer and is meant to be conversational in nature, is being recorded, that we have live interpretation available in Arabic thanks to the efforts of Mr. Aslan Iskandar, and that you are invited to submit questions throughout the event using the Q&A function. And I will be directing those questions to the panelists in the second half of today's conversation. Without further ado, I'm eager to introduce our esteemed panelists. I don't exaggerate when I say that I could spend all day regaling you with their remarkably impressive bios, so please forgive me for shortening them in the interest of beginning the conversation. First, we have Mr. Muhammad Al-Abdullah, who is a Syrian human rights and democracy researcher and activist. He is a former prisoner and survivor of torture who was imprisoned in Syria on two separate occasions for his work defending human rights and lobbying for political reform. Mohammed is the director of the Syria Justice and Accountability Center. Next, we have Mr. Yazan Asadi, who is a writer, researcher, critic, comic zealot, and a senior journalist at the Public Source in Beirut, Lebanon. His work and research focuses on the West Asian region, covering an array of topics, from pop culture to politics to economic theories and sociological issues. Next up, we have Ms. Yasmin Omar, who is a human rights lawyer and the Egypt Legal Associate at the Tahrir Institute for Middle East Policy. She practiced law in Egypt for a decade before moving to the United States to specialize in international human rights law. Her work today focuses on engaging with international legal tools, such as the UN Working Group and Global Sanctions to Seek Accountability. Yasmin is also a board member of the US Committee to End Political Repression in Egypt. And last but not least, we have Ms. Emna Gilleli, who is a jurist and Libyan-Tunisian human rights activist. She is currently Amnesty International's Deputy Regional Director for the Middle East and North Africa and is based in Tunis. She was previously a researcher on Algeria and Tunisia at Human Rights Watch. Without any further ado, let's get into the conversation. And Emna, I'd love to start with you and the case of Tunisia a country whose civil society has taken creative steps over the last decade to hold government officials accountable, from projects that report on parliamentary activity to steps that make information more accessible. What have some of these efforts looked like? And more broadly, what has success in the accountability space looked like in Tunisia? Emna, you're muted. Yeah. I'm, I am muted myself. So uh, hi, everyone. And thanks very much, May and all the organizers of this uh, very interesting event for inviting me. Um, when I mean, yeah, since the, the fall of the Ben Ali regime and during the 10 years of the uh, democratic transition in Tunisia, there have been uh, a plethora of initiatives uh, led by civil society groups in order to hold accountable uh, those in power and also to um, implement accountability for past human rights violations. And these initiatives uh, have a broad uh, range and uh, are, are quite uh, varied in nature. Uh, for example, one of the leading initiatives uh, 
that um, took place uh, for, since the beginning of the parliamentary work uh, after the elections of the uh, National Constituent Assembly, which was uh, elected in order to uh, write and draft a new constitution for Tunisia. Um, civil society as a group of uh, young uh, men and women uh, created uh, a watchdog uh, called Al Bawsala, uh, which has been really leading the effort to uh, uh, foster uh, transparency and uh, accountability and access to information uh, when it comes to the work of the parliament. And they played really a pivotal role in ensuring that the public is kept aware of uh, what is happening inside the National Constituent Assembly and then inside the um, National uh, Parliament after the elections of 2014. And they uh, really became um, one of the leading organizations to work on transparency and accountability in Tunisia. Um, there were also other um, initiatives to foster accountability for uh, the crimes of corruption and embezzlement of public funds through the creation of different uh, watchdog groups uh, and the creation also of institutions in charge of uh, working on corruption cases and um, sending, uh, collecting information about corruption by state officials and sending them to the uh, judiciary. But I think the, what I would like to focus on is more accountability for past human rights violations. And in this field, I think that Tunisia has uh, really had um, made very important strides. Um, the country underwent uh, an important transitional justice process uh, which aimed at in ending impunity for past human rights violations. And so uh, this was led through the creation of um, what we call in Tunisia, this institution called Instance Vérité et Dignité, the Truth and Dignity Commission, uh, which uh, was um, uh, created uh, by law, uh, the law on transitional justice. Uh, and took office in 2014 and started um, digging into the history of human rights violations, uh, collecting information about the perpetrators and unraveling the, the uh, foundations of the system of oppression that uh, uh, existed in Tunisia during decades uh, since uh, its independence from France. After, uh, during this period of time, so between 2014 and 2000. Uh, uh, 19 roughly, this um, commission, this truth commission, uh, also uh, was the key in establishing uh, uh, other mechanisms for accountability. And so the law on transitional justice mandated also the creation of specialized chambers in charge of uh, judging cases of grave human rights violations and abuses committed during the Bourguiba and Ben Ali regimes. And these chambers are um, around, th I think, 13 around the country. Uh, they started uh, the, the first case before these chambers, uh, judging uh, um, a case of forced disappearance of a, an Islamist um, um, activist uh, back in the 19th. Uh, so the first, um, the first trial started in 2018. Uh, and since then, these chambers have been uh, attempting to um, hold accountable the perpetrators of grave human rights violations committed in Tunisia for the past uh, 60 years. However, the, the, these chambers and the transitional justice system uh, in general in the country faced many challenges. Uh, including the lack of cooperation by state authorities and by the Ministry of uh, Interior, uh, who really kind of obstructed the work of the chambers and the EVD in general, also attempts to undermine the uh, transitional justice process by uh, enacting new laws on impunity and giving immunity to state officials for human rights violations and uh, violations of uh, economic rights, such as corruption or embezzlement of uh, public funds. 
um, and also the, the latest um, instances of uh, these um, obstruction, obstructive efforts by uh, state authorities were uh, the lack of, the, um, the lack of uh, attendance by uh, the security services uh, who were uh, um, considered as um, you know, perpetrators or alleged perpetrators of these violations. Uh, they don't attend these hearings and uh, that kind of uh, translated into the slow pace of the hearings and the lack of accountability and um, the lack of um, advances in the, in the trials. Uh, so, in a nutshell, this is um, this is a summary of the accountability efforts. But it's like really there there is a lot to say, and I look forward to your uh, questions on this. <clears throat> Thank you, Amna. Um, you've given us a lot to think about, and I'm going to come back to you later in the conversation. And I anticipate that some of our speakers who have also engaged in the transitional justice space might have uh, things to add as well. In Lebanon, endemic corruption has been at the root of the crisis that we see worsening today. Public interest reporters and investigative journalists have played important roles to hold officials, parties, and business actors to account in the country and across the region. Yazan, I'd love to bring you in and for you to share with us a bit about the story of the public source, why it was created, and what proactive role journalists have been able to play in Lebanon in the accountability space. Uh, thank you very much for having me on this wonderful panel. Uh, I do have to warn you, I have two cats stuck in the room with me. So if they meow, I apologize. But uh, with the events today, uh, as a very interesting example, we have to work with the chaos in life. Um, so the story of the public source. Uh, the story of the public source started with two people. Lara Bitar and Karim Shayeb, both journalists by trade, both uh, really journalists. And when I say journalists by trade, mainly they are journalists that really cut their teeth going on the street, you know, not the usual type of journalism that we see that's wire based, where you're sitting behind a computer that unfortunately dominates a lot of media content these days, you know, listicles and uh, so forth. So both Lara and Karim wanted to create an organization, a media organization that is as independent as possible and catered towards investigations. Now, when I say investigations, I mean long form pieces that really goes into the devilish details. Uh, not your average reading that people are used to. Uh, most of the media content are what, uh, 500 to 750 words which I would argue is never enough to really explain the who, what, how, why, and where. So both these two individuals wanted to create an organization that is horizontal. And they started working on that end. Meanwhile, in Lebanon, things were brewing. And obviously, uh, it came to head in the uprising of October 17th. That kind of gave them the push to really start the organization, get in recruits and really build a team that develops the stories that we do today, which is investigative types of journalism, adding context, long form and depth. Why is that important? I mean, it makes me think of the history of journalism in its entirety. One of the most famous moments in journalism at least what I heard about was the muckrakers, as they're called in America. These types of journalists that work through in the times of the robber barons, if you know what I mean. Uh, basically, the super rich in the late 19th century, early 20th century, really dominating and exploiting people. And that's when really investigative journalism flourished, right? They were called muckrakers because they were going through the muck the trash and the grime to unveil the truth. What we've seen in the world of journalism for the past 10 years is the sort of defeat of investigative journalism. We've seen a lot of cuts and budget cuts in most mainstream media, whether in the West or in the East. So a lot of that is catered or a lot of that has moved towards independent types of journalism, the Wikipedias and so forth to leak things. 
But then you have a problem of quality, uh, biasness, uh, so many ethical questions. So I think it, one of the most important things is to fill that gap. And that's kind of why the public source exists. Not only was there a gap in investigative journalism in Lebanon, but truly it's a gap internationally and it's a big crisis in journalism uh, universally, I would argue, especially in a time when we're, we see things like the ease of misinformation and miscommunication, a lot of simplifications, uh, a lot of distortions. So I think there is a role for investigative journalism to really clarify, you know, to move past the muck and show the truth, the gem of the truth. But it does have its limitations, which I think we'll talk about in uh, the upcoming round. I can stop here, but if there's any follow-up questions, I would really love to hear the next guests, actually. I know, I'm just gonna push you for a quick one minute answer. Could you maybe tell us just a little bit, building off of the story of the public source, what you view the role of the public source in the grander accountability space? I mean, the public source in its ideal norm is to be a source for the public. You know, <laughs> like obviously it needs to be a place where people can come to share information that is vital for the public knowledge. So that's the role I, we hope to play, right? To clarify things. I think one of the best stories, if I can mention, one of the best things we were able to do lately was to try and show a clear count of the dead for the Beirut blast. Because officially, the official numbers placed them at 190, according to the ministry. We were able to clarify numbers up to 230 and beyond. That's something that matters for the public. It matters for the people that died and the victims and so many, so many reasons, obviously. So I think that's the best thing we can do. Now, on the question of accountability, I think there's a larger, harsher fight that journalists can play, but it might require them to really rethink how they operate the processes and their roles and even the discourses we implement. Again, we'll leave it for another conversation soon enough, but I hope that answers your question. It does. Thank you, Yazan. Um, absolutely. Let's move on to Egypt, where far-reaching repression has been grounded in the law. But in turn, lawyers and legal advocates have leveraged the law to bring about accountability, using tools like strategic litigation and international legal action. Yasmin, I'd like to invite you to reflect on the successes in the accountability space in recent years, both inside the country of Egypt and outside by Egyptian lawyers and advocates as well. Thank you, May, and uh, thanks to Yazan and Emna for the uh, interesting context to provide. Well, Egypt is no different than any other country in the region. It has increasing impunity and decreasing accountability due to political uh, events. However, in, in since the, the 40s, Egyptian lawyers has been an integral part of the social movements and the political scene. They have been always supported political parties, uh, victims of human rights violations, uh, civil society, given them consultation and legal aid. However, this role grew to uh, challenge the law itself and to negotiate the law itself. Usually legislations were in Egypt are mainly created to protect the state, to give more rights to the state over the rights of the citizens or what the citizens need. So the lawyers started to challenge the law itself before courts, asking to uh, explain a certain vague provision or asking to uh, 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 asking the state to oblige by a certain uh, constitutional uh, obligation. And this way, lawyers contributed to the development of the law itself and to the jurisprudence around it, and of course, rule of law eventually. However, uh, um, this did not, was not enough. Uh, filing the cases before courts is not the only way for accountability. Those lawyers also used their own platform to speak to the public about the cases, to bring awareness about these cases uh, in, in, the, in the public sphere. Not only this, but all this work 
help engaging engaging the public with the most controversial cases in, in a country like Egypt, cases of my, uh, religious minorities, for example, cases of uh, uh, women, women's rights, LGBTQ and transgender's rights. And this helped developing the human rights uh, 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 community itself and its response to, uh, to, to cases. Uh, Unfortunately, after the military coup in 2014, this hasn't been very successful. The, the judiciary in Egypt has been suffering from almost complete politicization. So each decision comes from a court. There is a, a high possibility that it's not coming out according, according to the law. But this, this did not stop lawyers from continuing their work on filing the cases, even if the outcome is not going to be what they hoped for, but this work for future accountability, documenting what actually happened and have this uh, recorded at, in, in a court, in a court uh, record. Uh, um, it's, it's not totally useless still filing cases. However, there are other, other tools also like international litigation. Lawyers in Egypt have and, and outside of Egypt has been developing their tools to be able to file cases before international tribunals and regional tribunals like the African court. However, a tool that is not being used often is not developed enough to, to, to seek rights because it's, these tools are not often used by, by, by many lawyers. It's not developed enough to uh, be able to uh, uh, provide accountability now. However, I think in the future with a little bit of working uh, with the lawyers, training and uh, 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 developing legal curriculum, this, this is the hope for strategic litigation and accountability at the end. Yes, me and I wanna ask you a follow-up question. What does it mean then when lawyers are targeted by the state? What does that mean for the rule of law and accountability? Well, because lawyers are, are have been playing a vital role in, in the, 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 the uprisings in Egypt, the social movements, they are like human rights defenders, like civil society workers, has been heavily targeted because of their work. It, the, 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 the targeting and the threatening has reached to severe limits that lawyers are being arrested from the prosecution offices while they are uh, uh, representing their clients for the same charges of their own clients. And we've seen other uh, uh, examples of lawyers being kidnapped from the streets, being forcibly disappeared, tortured, and much, much severe uh, reprisals. And this does not come out of context of targeting all the human rights community in Egypt, but lawyers specifically because they work within the frame where the state is grounding its oppression, which is the law. So this, they, they are the, the, the biggest threat to the state because they speak the same language, they use the same tool, and was the only way to, to shut them down is to uh, arrest them and make them another category, another oppressed category, not the leaders that they are, not the integral part of communication between the society and the rights and the rights community. And here where it comes the 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 biggest the biggest danger. Now we have over a hundred lawyer in prison, and this is like not the, even the most recent uh, count of lawyers in prison. We have lawyers who faced other uh, reprisals, lawyers who had to live in exile and leave their practice and all of their experience behind them and, and learn other ways to seek accountability. Um, this, this, this problem will continue to, to, to exist as long as there are no enhancement in the human rights field at all in Egypt. Thank you, Yasmin. I'd like to move on um, to Mohammed. With Syria, we have before us a context of mass crimes and abuses, nearly half of the population displaced, and it feels almost impossible to realize accountability, particularly inside the country. Mohammed, I want to ask you, what has accountability looked like for Syria in the last decade, and what have been some of the notable achievements in this space? Thank you very much for having me, indeed, and thanks for everybody, Yazan, Yasmin, and Amna, for, for their remarks. Um, 
it's all goes on the same level or similar, like familiar stories with lawyers who have to leave the country and, and learn outside what to do uh, after, after they try to practice uh, and defend political prisoners in the, inside the country. But also it's unfortunate because um, it highlights that the entire region is really linked to each other. So you cannot really see possible political progress or reform in one country while the entire region is going from bad to worse. Um, for Syrians, the demand for accountability uh, from, from the beginning in 2011 uh, for the crimes committed by the government, but later by the opposition forces and by the third parties, all the states and non-state actors who joined the conflict, has been really big and has been a big demand for the people, but has been fluctuating a lot among the public opinion and Syrians. And this is very important because if you ask five Syrians what accountability does mean for you, you get five different answers. And this is logical, depends on their um, con condition of living. Are they refugees in a tent who wants to go back and they want to end this misery of living in a tent in a neighboring country or on a border in, in the summer and the cold in the winter? Or if they are settled outside and have some economic and political stability in their life and able to proceed with different like lives and careers. So it, it, the public opinion swinging, but there's one overarch theme, our, our overarching theme that's unless we see accountability for those most responsible of the crime committed in Syria, that accountability will be in somehow incomplete. It's not going to be satisfactory for the vast majority of, of the country. Nevertheless, there are success stories there. Um, among the refugees who made it out of Syria, uh, there's uh, uh, some fighters, there's some former officials, there's some former extremist uh, fighters um, who smuggled themselves with the refugee population. Like Germany only hosts around 800,000. And there's a handful of couple of cases or tens of cases identified by either human rights defenders in, in that country or by the federal police of, of Germany where they proceed these cases. The two famous cases so far is the Anwar Aslan case in Koblenz, Germany, who was a former head of an intelligence branch in Damascus, who defected from the regime in 2012 and joined the opposition. Nevertheless, he committed crimes prior to his defection, and he was heading an intelligence branch where dead bodies were coming out and they were doc well documented in the Caesar photos. The Caesar photos are the photos smuggled by a military photographer who defected from the government, getting thousands of images of dead bodies under torture. The second case is still yet to, to show up in court in Frankfurt is the case of a doctor um, who was torturing and executing patients allegedly for now because he's still on trial while he was a, 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 military, a, a doctor in a military hospital. And that shows also the level of torture and how systematic the, the practice. But if you look at the Syrians abroad, they don't have one agreement about those cases. They have disagreements on the, like every single details of them. Raslan was a defector. Should he, he put in trial or not? Is his trial sending the right message to the regime in Syria that your officials will face consequences? Or it sends the flipped message that if you defect from the regime and leave, you're going to face consequences. So stick with the regime and continue the violations you do. And you cannot isolate that context when you discuss Syria and accountability um, from how people um, were abused and they had to leave the country and the level of oppression they faced and the challenges to bring uh, justice and accountability outside. Now, we have two big themes running in parallel uh, general about, about accountability, and we are very sided with one theme, clear, and we disagree with our colleagues in the other camp. One, one camp highlights the use of the universal jurisdiction cases as justice accomplished. It's important. I'll get back what universal jurisdiction is in a, in a second. Uh, for non-legal uh, audience. And we're in the second camp where we think universal jurisdiction is a very important tool to use, but it will not accomplish the justice the Syrians are demanding. It's a piece of accountability uh, on the interim time because we do not have international tribunal for Syria and we do not have a, a jurisdiction by the International Criminal Court. So, so for the non-legal audience, the universal jurisdiction simply is the principle that allows a third country to practice uh, legal jurisdiction over a crime committed somewhere else, not by its citizens, not against its citizens, like Germany reviewing the crimes committed by Syrians against Syrians in Syria. And that principle changed a lot in the last 20 years. It was repressed a lot by the US in 2003 till 2007, eight, because the US was fearful that it was gonna be used against Donald Rumsfeld in Belgium or against some Israeli officials in, in the UK. So lots of the European governments, unfortunately, ended up trimming their universal jurisdiction laws, just accommodate the US 
I think 2006 was the only year the U.S. Defense Minister Donald Rumsfeld missed the NATO summit. He did not dare to go to Belgium because he thought he would be arrested or face charges there over Iraq and Afghanistan. Nevertheless, now the principle is flourishing again. It's expanding again. There's a good practice of it. Uh, there's no ju new jurisprudence, legal jurisprudence in that field that shows that how courts are um, creative and agile in practicing the universal jurisdiction and seeking justice. The limitation of the universal jurisdiction comes from the two facts that there is a head of state impunity. You cannot prosecute heads of state before national courts, regardless of what's the case. Like you cannot pro prosecute Bashar al-Assad, you cannot prosecute ministers as well uh, in front of uh, or before a national court. That makes the accountability sought before those national courts in Europe is from certain rank and below. And that's the question about the most responsible. Are those the most responsible really? Who destroy the country or or no they are uh, basically uh, just just a uh, small cog in that torture and, and and abuse system and the second issue is the difficulty of obtaining custody of those defendants if they are not in the eu and now with the two cases i cited both defendants are actually in germany and germany has physical custody of both of them they are in, in detention however there's a third case where the german federal prosecutor issued the prosecutor issued arrest warrants for three chiefs of intelligence branches in Syria, but the three of them are in Syria. And they're not going to travel to the EU because they are in the EU travel ban and sanctions list. They're not going to go to any country who's going to extradite them to the EU. And neither Syria, Russia, or Iran, where they could be located, will extradite them. Um, so there's concrete limitation of the utilization of universal jurisdiction that's being sometimes blown out of portion to say like justice accomplished we had one official prosecuted and if you ask five Syrians again about this I don't think we will all agree on that definition of accountability. Thank you Mohammed and I think your your point um, really underscores the complexity of justice the complexity of accountability and what it means depending on where you sit and I think that's a theme that comes up across all of the, um, the panelists um, insights. Much to my chagrin, I, I tried to start off this, this first round of questions with the successes of accountability, and somehow we found ourselves talking about the challenges, which leads me into the next uh, round of questions. A reminder to our audience that I, I'm going to do one more round of questions, and I'm going to begin incorporating your questions as well, so please do submit them using the, the question and answer function. Uh, Yasmin, this time I'm going to start with you. Recognizing the powerful role that lawyers and legal advocates play, Egyptian authorities have often targeted lawyers for their legal defense work. Yasmin, you began to talk about this crackdown and what it looks like, but I want to ask you, now that you've explained the crackdown, what lessons can we take from it to ensure that the legal community is actually supported and empowered to play the role that they really need to play when it comes to any sense of accountability in Egypt? Thank you, May, and not to uh, disappoint you, I'd like to speak about the successes of the legal uh, uh, of the legal efforts to seek accountabilities first, before we talk about how we can develop these successes and how we can support lawyers to continue the work that they do. Lawyers has been filed cases in regards to social and economic rights, and these has been successful, successful in raising the minimum wage uh, 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 limit in Egypt, it's successful in ending discrimination based on social class, believe it or what or not, this was still it happens in Egypt until recently. And also, even when lawyers are success are succeeded before courts, like at the case of Tehran and Sanafir, when the Egyptian president handed two Egyptian islands to Saudi Arabia without a referendum. Uh, lawyers has won this case. However, the decision was uh, was finalized anyway, and the islands went to Saudi Arabia because there wasn't rule of law, there wasn't a political will to commit to uh, the court order. So this brings me to how lawyers can develop their existing amazing tools, their amazing experience in strategic litigation. That, well, uh, I think we can start by uh, uh, mentioning the challenges in, in, in the tools that they're using. Lawyers who are trying to use uh, international uh, advocacy tools or, or litigation tools uh, are, are, are lacking, exp are lacking uh, uh, communication. These tribunals does not, did not 
develop a, 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 an easy way to communicate with lawyers who does not speak English, who does not uh, uh, have a, a background in working with the African court, for example. Sanction, global sanctions programs has has pros, but also has cons in regards to uh, uh, relating the decision to political tension. If there is a sanctioned decision, this could be revised or put, put aside based on the political relation with a certain country. And I think because these programs are kind of uh, new ones, they're new, they're not developed enough to uh, understand and comprehend all the legal background of this work. But I think us uh, discussing this now and bringing it to the public is necessary to develop, to, 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 to develop these uh, tools. Uh, I think, May, you had a, another part to your question, how to help lawyers in Egypt get through what they are facing now, the targeting, the threatening, and the grave human rights violations that they're facing. I think that there is, um, uh, civil society in Egypt is doing uh, a good job speaking, uh, 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 being outspoken about the cases, supporting them, providing them with legal aid. However, I see that the, the, the crisis of the, what happens to Egyptian lawyers is not visible yet to other professionals around the world, to other practitioners of law and international law, to other uh, bar associations. Uh, and this, be, this, this, this is happening because there hasn't been a real connection between the Egyptian Bar Association and other international bars. And this will, will, where, where the gap in information happens. This is something that we are trying to work on. But I also encourage other human rights lawyers. I know we're all busy. We have lots of torture cases to, to care about. However, supporting other practitioners, other colleagues enhances rule of law in the whole region and helps bring about more accountability, having those lawyers free and able to work. And I hope this answer answered the question that we have received about cases. Thank you, Yasmin. May, can, um, I, can I make a quick intervention? Please, please. Uh, when Muhammad. Yasmin highlighted the difficulty of working with international mechanisms or even regional mechanisms, we definitely have seen this in Europe for Syrians. Uh, Syrians who were resettled either in Germany, France, Netherlands, Sweden, they do not speak the new language. They do not know the new laws. Even the ones who had legal practices or legal background in Syria are not licensed, at least yet, in those new countries. They do not know the new laws. So it was very challenging for Syrians to access those justice mechanisms, although they're available and there is a universal jurisdiction. So what we did, I dropped a link in the chat, sorry, without a context, but I'm explaining what is it. We drafted six briefs on each country in English and in Arabic, explained the process in very oversimplified language that does not have legal jargons, basically. Just like, hey, do you have a case? Are you a citizen? You don't have to be, you can file. Are you a resident? Only permanent residents can file. Or um, there's certain perceptions and clearly fear among the refugee communities, at least the, the Syrian refugees, and that they might impact their asylum case if they file a case and the case is lost in court. And if they don't have, so we, we sim simplified those in the link. There's a good explanation about the six countries, I think seven countries. We did one on the US, although the US universal jurisdiction is very, very narrow, trafficking in people, and there's a little bit of on torture. But um, but that's that's important comment that um, like those mechanisms are not easily accessible even for people with legal background. Thank you, Mohammed, for for jumping in, and and I think that's a big theme um, that we'll see across the conversation: accessibility, both when it comes to language, but also when it comes to speaking in a language that everyone can understand. I think as accountability advocates, we often talk in big terms that are not accessible. But what good is that if we can't? engage and directly involve survivors and victims and what have you. So I think there's room for all of us to be growing, whether we sit in, in the regional mechanism or an international mechanism or as human rights lawyers or as folks who speak English and largely engage in that language, there's so much to be done. And Mohammed, since you actually began uh, to jump in, I wanna tag on a question directed really to you. Relying on foreign courts and on international bodies and mechanisms has meant that the path toward accountability is not a purely legal one, but rather it, it's an equally political one. Politics is a big factor here, as much as we hate to admit it. What have the resulting challenges looked like in practice and how do accountability advocates deal with the politicization of the law and the rule of law and accountability? 
Now, this is indeed one of the, realistically, one of the challenges um, that hit Syria, for example. Uh, the UN Security Council had an attempt to refer Syria to the International Criminal Court in May 2014, got double vetoed by Russia and China. And Russia, China, uh, Russia vetoed the referral to the ICC even prior to the Russian military intervention in Syria. So this is even before they committed the crimes in Syria, they vetoed the resolution. So you can use your imagination what they're going to do now to block any meaningful accountability measures to, uh, to come into Syria. Similarly, um, um, any resolution from the UN to create or establish a special tribunal for Syria is going to be vetoed. So that's why we're stuck for now with the only possible, basically, alternative or viable uh, venue, which is the universal jurisdiction. It has limitation, as we mentioned. It's not bad, but it's not going to accomplish the justice the Syrians are looking for, or or at least demanding. Um, the other issue is justice for Syrians goes beyond the criminal accountability, and this is an issue we highlight a lot as a transitional justice organization. I want to tag into Amna's comment about the about the transitional justice and the the, um, the transitional justice committee and all the work happened in Tunisia uh, on this regard, but. Uh, we, we look at the truth telling mechanisms because in Syria there's 20 versions of truth today. And if you want to reconcile those truths in one truth, you need solid documentation and data for it. Um, the, the, the way that security agencies and the judiciary behaved around the detainees and the detention and torture is something that's not going to be revised unless we have meaningful institutional reform for those institutions. If you want to at least prevent the occurrence. Um, and that's why we try to differentiate between accountability and justice. That's why we have both in our name, Syria Justice and Accountability Center. Principally, accountability, you did it wrong, you have to be behind bars, and that's, that's the deal with it. But making the, the whole community feel redressed and they put them all back together is very, very challenging um, task. It, it's long term, takes decades, and we like it or not, it's going to leave big sectors of the country dissatisfied with the results. No matter how you try to accommodate people and cater for the needs, uh, of different uh, groups and subgroups or marginalized groups or even the majority of the survivors, you will not be able to satisfy everyone. And this is a big challenge. When we, it goes to the advocacy, I can highlight it later with, with a further comment. And the challenge and the problem of speaking on behalf of the others. This is the demand of the people are here and the reality is actually here. And they're gonna be disappointed. And But if you don't manage their expectations from the get go, you're gonna disappoint them further after they wait couple of years and then they realize what they've been over promised is not going to be accomplished and this is very difficult um, balance let's let's say put, to put it together you want those people buy in in the process but also you don't want to oversell them any account accountability process that's not going to lead to them feel redressed uh, after all one final comment is um, about the politicization of the process um, and this is came from uh, the former U.S. ambassador to Syria, Theodore Khattouf. We were in a radio show together, and somebody called the show and said, "Why Syria doesn't go to the ICC?" And I, I answered the same question: Syria is not a member state of the ICC, and we need a Security Council resolution to go there. And Ambassador Khattouf raises that, saying, "No, I'll tell you my version of the story. I was ambassador in your country, and Bush administration cabled us and asked us to go around the ministries and tell them do not sign the ICC agreement in 2004." So I met with Walid al muallim who was, used to be the foreign minister or deputy foreign minister at the time. And we told them the US is not keen about any country signing the Haram Statute to join the ICC. So this is to put things in perspective that international powers, when they decide on violating human rights or covering those violating human rights, they can get away with it. And that's what they're, what they're doing. There's a small initiative in the UN called the French Mexican Initiative to limit the, the, the use of veto power when it's related to the atrocities and war crimes and crimes against humanity. Just to allow the P5 not to use veto when there's a human suffering involved. Only France and the UK agreed to entertain the idea. Not only Russia and China said no to it, but the US was the primary rejecter for it. So if we don't be consistent about human rights and about all what's happening in the region, see how, how Yemen is being treated and the Commission of Inquiry is uh, Yemen's voted to be uh, um, terminated recently in the Human Rights Council because there's one very strong ally, Saudi Arabia, managed to manipulate the scene and pressure all the political parties there. So when, when this is all visible for the others, it sends only the wrong messages to the people who no longer believe in the process and they will agree with you 100% May, it's politicized process, but also to the dictators who are going to think like, yeah, 
they're getting away with it, we can get away with it. So it sends the wrong messages to every party. And unfortunately, part of the advocacy efforts that's missing is not lobbying on pressuring those governments, uh, the bad governments in the region, but pressuring the good governments in the West who should take a different approach in dealing with us and stop looking at the people in the region as just, I don't know, as rats for labs, and we test theories of change on them and then see how it's gonna, it's gonna resolve. Thank you, Hamed. And I, I think there's there's a theme here that's arising also that we are all connected <laughs> from an accountability perspective and from a reality perspective, the MENA region, certainly, which is why I'm so glad we're having this cross-country conversation, but the entire world as well. And I think it's really important that MENA stories kind of be uplifted and centered in the larger accountability discourse, because that's another theme that I think is coming up time and time again, the needs, the realities, um, the situation of the MENA region is not necessarily always incorporated or built into the international legal system. And I think it's the efforts of, of folks like the panelists we have today that's that's beginning to change that. Um, now I want to bring you back in. <laughs> We've heard a lot of the panelists reference Tunisia a few times now and begin to talk about transitional yeah, justice. The current moment in Tunisia is testing civil society as well as its advocates for accountability and the rule of law. And now what challenges have those mobilizing toward accountability and justice, including transitional justice, faced in Tunisia in recent years and in this current moment? And what lessons does this teach us for the way forward? Uh, thanks, May. Uh, in terms of the challenges that the um, civil society groups and other civic forces have uh, uh, faced in the recent years in Tunisia. I mentioned a few uh, earlier on, but I just wanted to, you know, uh, have a more uh, explanation about like what happened uh, during these years. Um, there were several attempts to undermine the transitional justice process uh, by passing laws such as a reconciliation law. Uh, that granted uh, immunity to state, uh, former state officials for um, corruption um, crimes. Uh, and there were also attempts to end altogether the transitional justice process. What, you know, when I was very, really carefully listening to uh, all the other speakers and uh, learning a lot from what they are saying and compared to Tunisia I think what makes the transitional justice process and efforts towards accountability in the country really interesting and um, uh, positive is the fact that it was really something that um, was fostered and created inside the country so a national system of accountability a national transitional justice system uh, that is not that much linked to any international fora, uh, but still, you know, there, there were all the conversations initially uh, held before the creation of the IVD, the uh, Instance Verité et Dignité, uh, learning from the various, you know, um, uh, experiences that were uh, created uh, of transitional justice uh, around the world, and then like uh, going through this exercise of uh, having this new mechanism, this truth commission, um, created on the basis of a negotiated and really concerted effort from civic forces and from the political uh, parties uh, inside the Parliament to uh, get to this, um, to create this uh, institution. But the, the creation of a, a transitional justice mechanism does not stop there, in the sense that that's when the, challenge, the real challenges uh, arise, because even despite all the efforts made by the IVD and all the, you know, like truth um, seeking um, initiatives in Tunisia, uh, they were met with a lot of resistance. And this resistance comes from, you know, what we can call the deep state, all those forces that were aligned with the former regime, all those who enabled uh, the, uh, the existence of these uh, oppressive, um, you know, mechanisms in the country, and uh, these forces obviously were really not 
very happy with the existence of such a, a mechanism and try to uh, undermine uh, it in all kinds of ways and with all possible means, including the legislative you know, initiatives such as the reconciliation law I, I uh, mentioned and um, creating also an environment that is so hostile to the transitional justice system that it became almost uh, impossible for anyone to relate to it in Tunisia. I mean, like many, many, if you ask, um, maybe, I don't know if it's a majority of people, but many um, people and, uh, you know, um, a good part of the political opinion uh, became uh, really hostile toward the tra transitional justice system because there was a demonizing um, discourse. Uh, which was not innocent or, you know, um, um, it didn't come about uh, in a very, uh, um, you know, uh, spontaneous way, basically. It was created by the, um, the kind of smear, you know, like a media, uh, still very powerful and uh, still uh, aligned with uh, some of the forces that uh, enabled the, the former regime to uh, to exist, and they created the system and uh, an atmosphere of uh, hatred and uh, rejection of the transitional justice system. So that's where the role of civil society in Tunisia was so important because um, the civic groups um, created platforms for the support of the transitional justice system. They um, created coalitions, um, coalitions that uh, came about despite all the political divides uh, and where there were uh, alliances uh, that were not uh, necessarily very natural between, uh, you know, Islamist leaning uh, groups and uh, uh, more uh, leftist groups. Uh, which uh, at the end came together in order to support the transitional justice system. And this, I, I really believe that the civic forces in Tunisia were able to push back against all the attempts to uh, undermine the transitional justice system and to undermine the efforts in terms of truth seeking and uh, the, all the judicially, judicial judicial um, initiatives uh, to hold accountable those uh, um, responsible for human rights violations. Uh, these coalitions were also instrumental in uh, pushing back against laws, for example, in uh, creating uh, the, the, uh, the environment uh, conducive to better accountability and uh, to the end of impunity. Now these groups and the, these coalitions are now facing really incredible challenges because of the situation in the country. Um, normally they uh, were very much um, um, targeting the parliament because the parliament is, you know, like the uh, institution in charge of revising the laws and reforming the laws that enabled the system of oppression to exist. Uh, and the parliament does not exist anymore. So, uh, you know, like the targets uh, of uh, the advocacy are, are a bit uh, difficult to find. Uh, also in light of the president's absence of any appetite for uh, dialogue with civil society groups and with civic forces in general, and even political forces, by the way. So this absence of dialogue and the absence of uh, any concerted effort to, um, you know, support the transitional justice process uh, is definitely one of the major challenges uh, that the civic forces are facing. Uh, the other challenge is definitely the fact that the, the justice system is one of the victims also of this uh, situation uh, because there, there is also a discourse of demonizing of the judiciary. Uh, there is a paralysis of the judicial system more or less, uh, given the fact that for 75 days we didn't have uh, a minister of justice, that doesn't really translate into uh, something, you know, um, uh, something impacting the day-to-day -day work of the tribunals, but in terms of the political space and the political, you know, uh, the policies of the state 
when it comes to uh, truth and justice for past human rights violations, uh, it's difficult to lead any initiative today because of this, uh, not political vacuum, but the uncertainty basically around the political situation. Thank you, thank you, Amna. Um, Yazan, I have one more question for you before we begin tackling the audience questions, which are coming in very, very quickly. Um, Yazan, while journalists in Lebanon and across the region have played an essential role in accountability, whether by storytelling or informing the public or even doing some public interest reporting like that of the public source, you've also told me that there have been limits to what investigative and public interest journalism can accomplish. Why is that? And what can we as a greater accountability community do to magnify and strengthen the role of journalism in Lebanon? Thank you so much. And I found the entire conversation very, very fascinating. Uh, ultimately, what are the limits? So let's say you have a story and you unveiled a moment of corruption or torture or whatnot. Then what? And that I think is the common theme that we constantly hear here. Um, I think while I'm listening to everyone here, there is a very nice quote from an author I thoroughly enjoy. And he wrote once that there are two types of people that laugh at the law, those who break it and then those who make it. And I think that is really what we're facing. And it's not just limited towards what's happening in Lebanon and as the events over the investigation of the Beirut port attests to. It is a problem in the region, as we've seen in cases like Syria and what Mohammed said with Yemen and Palestine, where there is no accountability or justice, regardless of the investigations or researches that numerous people have done over time. And it's not only limited to our region, it's an international issue. I mean, the recent cases of Pandora or Panama, the person that unveiled the Panama Papers was killed by a car bomb. Was there any accountability for that? No. And what we see today as well with the ICC's decision on Afghanistan, where US forces are not to be examined or investigated for their crimes, just the Taliban and the Islamic State. And as Mohammed rightly pointed out, there is something rotten inherently with the entire system. So that's what we're really facing. We're really facing this, not only as journalists, but as individuals living in the 21st century, where we're faced with these larger existential problems of accountability of our societies. And it touches everything. I don't think it's just politics is removed. This really comes down to things like climate change or gender or anything in between finances. Um, so I think there is a larger question that we need to have as people from below, not the decision makers and those with power, because clearly at the moment might makes right, as we've seen with Russia and Syria, the US and Israel, uh, the Saudis and Yemen, might makes right. How do we from below change that? And what do we do? Do we continue to play the game as they set up, even though the game is fixed? I can work through the process of the rule of law, but when those are more powerful than me, do not even play the same rules. Is it even sane to continue on that route? These are legitimate questions we really need to engage with. We really need to start imagining different forms of transitional justice and accountability that is beyond just the courtroom. You know, these images, because I would argue these images of justice inherently is flawed. I mean, one of the greatest examples I was taught uh, when I studied international law was the Nuremberg trials, right? This is the gem of international justice. But the Nuremberg trials was formed by Stalin's famous lawyer who created the show trials of the 1930s in the Soviet Union. And the whole point was to show that we, the powerful, the victors, determine the law. That's the major lesson in international law. And that really is what drives a lot of international justice. So there is an inherent problem there, especially from you know, people in the third world or from below. We are not the same. So we really need to rethink our roles here or how we play law 
what does law even mean? The other thing they taught me, and I don't know if this is the usual thing they teach in law school, but I was taught this in my master's in international law, is that law and justice do not meet. And I think that is a problem. Law and justice do, do not meet. This is what professors teach you. And I think law and justice should meet. So there's something that Muhammad said. He's like, we should manage the expectations of the people because obviously the process won't give them what they want. My argument is that no, it's not managing the people because the process is flawed. It's about hammering the process in order to fit what the people deserve in terms of justice. It is a constant battle. And we've seen this not only limited in our region. I mean, look at Spain. To date, they're still dealing with the trauma of Franco and the disaster that that fascist government has done. I am not surprised that for Syria, and as a Syrian, I am with you, that our battle for justice we will, will take decades, but we must face it. We totally must face it. Anyways, to tie it back up, it is a limitation to journalists and investigative uh, investigators because what about accountability? There has to be something else. And we need to start thinking and being creative about how we get these people or hold these people accountable. And I, I mean, seriously creative here. Thanks, Yazan. I think you've given us a lot to think about, and I think that's absolutely true. Um, I want to tie in a few questions from the audience, um, one of which is from Kareem Sa'a and, and another from Asala and Dohi. They both allude to the, to the role of the media. And we talked with Yazan about how the media can play a role toward achieving accountability. But on the flip side, it's also the case that the media can play a role in demonizing lawyers, in demonizing the rule of law, in demonizing transitional justice, the selection of the words. Um, I think this is a theme across all countries. And I want to open it up to the speakers and see if anyone can reflect a little bit about how authorities or those in power have used the media to weaken the path towards accountability and what we as accountability advocates can do about it. Uh, Amna, maybe I'll start with you because Tunisia was kind of invoked as an example here, but I again welcome all the, the speakers to jump in. I again welcome all the speakers to jump in. Yeah, thanks for the questions. Um, I think, I think yeah, and Tunisia could really be considered as one of the examples where the media played um, a very contrasted role at the end uh, in terms of uh, um, how they dealt with the transitional justice process and accountability. Uh, as I said before, some of the media which did not really undergo any reform since the the fall of the Ben Ali regime and some of the media tycoons who owned the same um, media outlets uh, as before did, led, uh, did lead an effort to undermine the transitional justice process and to demonize the EVD. Uh, but other media also really tried to, uh, um, um, to, to make it accessible to make this process accessible to the public and to uh, uh, raise awareness of uh, what it meant to have accountability for human rights violations. Uh, now, I think what is very important in order to um, have a healthy media landscape uh, that really um, creates an environment uh, conducive to uh, accountability or participates in an environment conducive to accountability for human rights uh, abuses, I think is really reforming those institutions, reforming the laws that enabled uh, the kind of abuses that happened before. Uh, I think the, 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 the mistake that... Uh, um, was um, you know that happened in Tunisia was the fact that they uh, the authorities or the political you know elite and civic civil society elite looked at uh, accountability in a very piecemeal way. So uh, they wanted really to uh, have like a mechanism for uh, accountability on human rights violations, but they didn't really integrate that in a comprehensive. Uh, effort 
to look at all the different institutions that were instrumental in the repressive apparatus, including the media. And so that's why, uh, despite all the different, you know, like very cosmetic changes that ma were made to the media landscape, it remained basically uh, in the hands of the very few people who were uh, already participating in the in the you know, repressive, uh, you know, uh, environment uh, created by the former regime. So that is one of the reasons I believe that made it difficult for uh, the transitional justice system and uh, created this uh, situation where the some of the media, the, the some of the most mainstream media basically uh, attacked the transitional justice system and considered it as uh, a political tool to uh, settle scores with uh, some of the, you know, uh, some of the very um, powerful uh, um, former regime figures and not a genuine attempt at transitional justice and accountability. Thanks, Amna. Anyone else want to jump in on this? I can, I can, I can jump quickly, if I may. Um, um, I agree totally with Karim. I don't think uh, managing expectations of people means to tell them um, you don't have to dream of actual accountability and justice. It's actually just letting them know what's realistically available for them and what's realistically to have to be seen, to be changed in the, in the foreseen future. But de definitely on the side with you that, that the system has lots of clauses and, and media as one of other tools is uh, used to either make uh, wrong information available, disinformation campaigns that's run clearly by country like Russia and by others in the even in the Arab world, Russia has an Arabic TV station, Arabic YouTube channel that was removed a couple of times from YouTube because they're broadcasting false news simply and they're making up uh, events. Um, but also look at the Arab media landscape that's funded and organized from Arab countries. Unfortunately, they run and funded by Arab states that are actually not the best supporters of democracy or democratic change. We see Saudi Arabia, Qatar and Emirates, the three uh, wealthy countries are not the biggest on human rights or not the best in human rights, let's say. And we've seen the case of Jamal Khashoggi, for example, that happened during the boycott time uh, from Saudi Arabia and, and Emirates against Qatar. So Al Jazeera talk, it's like space to expose what happened and expose the Saudi government and um, different stories about Khashoggi hosting all types of guests. Uh, when the reconciliation happened in the Gulf, the, the channel forgot the story totally, did not really cover it. And uh, they start revising the story. Some of their anchors like Jamal uh, Arayan tweeted that, oh, he was killed by mistake. And then he deleted the tweet after he got lots of harsh responses from the public. When you have liars like this guy and you have people like bold lies on the face of the public and they don't have that level of accountability from the constituents, that's problematic. The good side to the story is that there is that level of accountability on social media. So when those media outlets are flip-flopping, depends on the political narratives of their governments, clearly they're getting called out by social media, by people like uh, by you, Yazan, and by other groups who are um, simply calling out those mistakes. One final thing to comment, but this is not about the media, this is back to the general story. And I'm gonna cite a very, a very sad statement, but uh, black humor, if you wanna call it this way. Um, the US, Australia, Canada, and the EU issued a statement denouncing what China is doing with the Muslim minorities in China. And China countered that at the UN Human Rights Council with a statement basically saying China is not doing anything wrong and they have all the right to fight extremism in their country. Who signed was China's side? Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Emirates, Kuwait, Bahrain, Yemen, Syria, Algeria, Sudan, Jordan. So you'll see all those Muslim majority countries are siding with China and repressing their Muslims. <laughs> there. like, I had difficulties explaining this to non-Arabs in the region in our office, American colleagues, like how China is, how the Muslim majority countries are siding with China and repressing uh, the Muslims, uh, Muslim minorities in China. So to, to make the story relative to our uh, relevant to our uh, discussion is nobody has worked really in clarifying how political openness and how liberal values and how human rights respect will result in uh, good economic uh, improvement for those countries in the Middle East and in other places. Everybody is so narrowed focused on the Chinese model of you can repress your population, but you can make good investment and good policies and good uh, introduction to the international market. With the liberal democracies turning an eye whenever 
they can and introduce a concept of closed door discussion. So this government doesn't like to be criticized in public, so we're going to have closed door discussion with them. And that normalized the, the, this norm of the do not criticize those allies in public. We should take it with them behind closed doors because this is how they like it. Clearly, you start getting a list of countries who are not actually up to criticism or not on the list to, for criticism from, from any liberal democracy. One another example that's really bad when- the Hamad, Canadians... I'm, I'm just gonna have to, yeah, if in you a, can a, wrap up, because we a have a lot second, of yeah. other questions. Sure, yeah. in, in a second, when we can uh, criticize Saudi Arabia about the uh, uh, Saudi girl who left uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, went to Malaysia and Canada was trying to get her asylum. Saudi Arabia imposed sanctions on Canada, pulled their students from Canada. And the Canadians were left alone facing the Saudis in this. The US did not intervene, especially during Trump uh, era, and the EU did not Sp speak about it. So when when you speak about human rights and then you you see your liberal democrat friends like abandon you and let you face consequences, economic ex consequences in this case, alone, that does not set also good records for brushing those bad governments and forcing them for for some change. I'd like to jump in here because we have a few questions. I know Yasmin, you raised your hand, but I actually have a separate question from you. We have a number of questions from the audience and we are running out of time. So I want to remind the panelists, please no more than one to two minute answers. Um, I do want to incorporate as much of the audience discussion as possible. Um, a few questions that I'm going to combine for you, Yasmin. Um, there's a question about whether or not there have been successes in strategic litigation on political rights. I know you mentioned a few on socioeconomic rights in Egypt. That's one quick question. Another question on what you think um, the Regeni trial, which begins today in Rome, which began earlier today on poli police Im impunity. What does that mean for the rule of law and what lessons can we learn kind of on these prosecutions that might be taking place outside of the country? Um, thanks, May, and I'll, tr I'll try to connect my answers while I reflect on Yezen's uh, point that international law and justice does not meet. This is kind of true also for domestic laws in, in many countries. So it's 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 really depends on how we perceive the law and how we treat it and how we consider it as just one player in the game of accountability that cannot win alone. We need other factors also. Um, so when it comes to political effect of strategic litigation in, in, in Egypt, there has been very minor political effect when it comes to challenging uh, uh, some uh, elections or, or uh, challenging a decision that denies somebody from practicing their political uh, rights or, or uh, political opinion. And this is not significant when it comes to what we need to reform in, in regards to uh, uh, in regards to political uh, effect in Egypt, but this comes also because the judiciary is not fully independent, and it it, it never has uh, been fully independent during any uh, uh, regime in Egypt. And not only that, it's not just that the judiciary is not independent, but a part of the judiciary, the prosecution, for example, is not only complicit in violating human rights by turning a blind eye or, uh, 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 or refusing to investigate certain crimes, but we have testimonies about prosecutors who engage in torture th themselves or engage in ill treatment themselves. And this brings about a realization that going to the court, seeking the legal means to, uh, to seek accountability is not going to be effective and it's not going to bring uh, uh, rights uh, back. However, what ha what's happening now to overcome this is that civil society organizations and human rights defenders are documenting these crimes and they're bringing these names out to the public. Who are, who's committing these crimes? What's, what their faces? What is their information? Because torture crimes does not, does not, uh, uh, does not have a time limitation. We can, we will sue you for what you did one day and will not go into forget this. And this is more effective if it's on a public source server, if it's provided to the people. It's not just lawyers. It's not about the law. The law is merely, merely a tool that we use to 
raise public awareness about the crimes and to affirm accountability in the future. And this is evident in the case of Julie Regini, which we are which we know that the court uh, uh, pressed the charges against the uh, the police office, Egyptian police officers who were uh, uh, um, who are accused of torturing and murdering the Italian researcher Giulio Regini in Egypt because of his uh, uh, academic research. This case, as many of you know, maybe others don't, have went through many stages of negotiation, of collaboration between the Egyptian prosecution and the Italian prosecution that ended up in total fail from the Egyptian side to admit or to provide uh, help or evidence or even uh, uh, provide them the space to investigate the crime in Egypt. And eventually, the Italian prosecution was able to retrieve enough evidence to bring these uh, 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 officers to court. However, and in anticipation of this move, Egypt has legislated a new legislation that gives the Egyptian co constitutional court the right to deny any other uh, international tribunals or uh, foreign courts uh, 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 verdicts against Egyptian officials or against what what touches Egyptian sovereignty, and will this be enough to protect those to protect those uh, uh, officers? Would this be enough to keep Egypt within the international community without? Uh, consequences for what they do, I doubt it because these officers, even if they're protected in Egypt, they they will be definitely separated from the international community. And this this is a sanction in itself, and it's not it's not enough. However, it shows that even when states separate themselves from the international legal system by legisl legislating weird legislation to protect themselves or to enable other, other uh, 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 jurisdictions' decisions, it will end up only in separating them from the, from the bigger society. And it will end up in, I think, severe consequences. Thank you, Yasmin. I think you, your point really underlies kind of one of the impacts of accountability efforts is not always just about the verdict or, or what results, but also the message it sends, the documentation, documentation it achieves, the truth telling it conducts, the, the message that it kind of sends. And I think this pushes us to think a little bit critically about what accountability can and can't accomplish, both in the immediate and in the long term. And, and this conversation, I think, really, you've all alluded to, to the complexity of the issue, but also um, the little things that we can look for and find when it comes to defining success. Yes, and I think uh, Yasmin was referring quite a bit to, to your comments earlier, and I want to check in with you if you, you want to jump in at this point. Uh, I can jump in for sure. Uh, there's a few thoughts on what's said, and uh, this is an ongoing conversation that's been going, and we, this debate about accountability seems quite timeless in human history. There is always this tension between trying to hold those with power, uh, you know, to account. I wonder, I wonder what Yasmin said, is it true that if they, you know, severed themselves from the international system that this will erode them over time? But I'm not so sure because we've seen a lot of examples of people that are under sanctions for horrific crimes, Omar Bashir for Sudan and the genocide over there, who just simply, you know, wavered that, that, that separation and re-injected himself into the system later on. Uh, I think another example is Bashar al-Assad, even though there were a lot of sanctions, as we all know, the Caesar sanctions and so forth, but a lot of accounts were opened up in Dubai, which everyone knew about. I mean, I wonder, I think, I think while I, I support the idea of, you know, documentation and getting it all there and truth telling, I also think there needs to be further edges to what we're doing here. We can't just suppose that things are going to work out over time. I mean, the truth will come out. Let's give another example in a quote unquote liberal democracy, Canada. There are bones under churches, children's bones. Was there accountability for that? Not, to not now, but they've been pushing for a long time. At least the bones have been shown. 
is anyone going to court or any of the churches or the officials? Because this continued until 1996. I, I'm not sure. But at least the bones have been discovered. At least those children can be buried, you know, with their family again. So there's cold comfort there. But I don't want to leave with despair. Because I do think that's what I was trying to say. I do think that there are ways to pursue justice and accountability outside of the norms and processes that these institutions are telling us to do. And we as individuals and as people, whether in our countries or this region or internationally, need to start organizing. Because what I understand, at least from my viewpoint, is that all these regimes, the quote unquote good and bad ones, where I think they're all bad, are actually learning from each other. They are learning. Bashar al-Assad could commit genocide on the Syrian people because the Israelis can commit genocide on the Palestinian people and have been doing so for 70 years. They watch and learn from each other. And that's something we need to keep in mind. Thank you, Yazan. We're just about wrapping up and I'm going to give all of the speakers an opportunity to do closing remarks, just a minute, <laughs> under a minute, please. I want to ask you for those who are willing to share, either in your closing remarks, to, to, to share with the audience what gives you hope with regards to accountability in the MENA region and or what it is you hope we as an accountability community, be we journalists, lawyers, documentarians, begin to do to come together from a regional perspective. Yes, me and I will start with you. Well, the case of, of Egypt is pretty hopeless, so it wasn't a good choice to start with me, but um, I've learned a lot from the conversation today, what Yazan and, and Mohammed uh, highlighted. Uh, it was really an eye-opener for us, someone who practiced law solely, but uh, I think I cannot have, I, the only hope I have is because there are still people who are in, on the ground fighting for accountability and seeking it using many ways and the law is one of them. So I'll have to take this moment and ask everybody to support and call for the freedom of the Egyptian human rights defenders, lawyers, journalists, uh, women, religious minorities. All these people are behind bar because of their expressing their opinion and because they seek accountability. And this journey of seeking accountability will not be resumed unless they're all free. So uh, I invite you all to do everything you can to call for their freedom and uh, their release from pretrial detention. Thank you. Thank you, Yasmin. Amna. Thank you. Um, I mean, unlike Yasmin, <laughs> I think I still uh, hold high hopes uh, in the accountability uh, mechanisms uh, and efforts uh, in Tunisia. Um, I think that despite all the difficulties and challenges of the current uh, situation and the lack of uh, any visibility about like what will happen next for the future of the country and all the you know risks of um, seeing uh, a backsliding into dictatorship or authoritarian rule, even the lack of checks and balances. Uh, right now on the um, acts and decisions of the president, I do believe that civil forces are, uh, have created, you know, like a space that is very difficult to, uh, um, to take back. And I, I believe that it's, uh, that transitional justice will remain really high on the agenda of everyone. Um, in the in the country, including all the the, the new government, hopefully. So uh, I think that uh, what we need right now is really um, get back on track when it comes to the democratic process and have a clear roadmap. Uh, whatever this is, you know, the, the president has refused to uh, to unveil his roadmap, but I think civil society now has a role to play to, you know, set the tone of what uh, should happen next. Um, it might seem too positive uh, given the current uh, situation, but yeah, I, that's what my hope is about the, the future. 
Thank you, Amna, and I appreciate that hope. Uh, it's what keeps many of us going. Mohammed. Yeah, I'm with Amna on the hope side, although I agree with Yazan completely on the system is, uh, has lots of flaws, has lots of issues. Um, we might have to rethink the entire system, but that's not what's available as at least as the time being and uh, working hard um, within the system, but also against the system and calling out all those flaws is something we do really well. And we do it against our donors to start with before we go to the other ones. Um, so this is something uh, we'll continue to do. It, it's clearly what May said, it's absolutely correct that the process to accountability and justice is politicized, but that also could work in our favor sometimes. The case when Yasser Abdelraze and the guys from the Egyptian initiative were released is because the CC regime appointed a PR company in DC to polish their image with the Biden administration. And that PR company told them, you have to release those guys or like guys, you're in trouble. But that of course did not block Sarkozy from uh, or Macron from send, uh, from selling weapons to, to to Egypt with all the bad human rights records. So it is welcome to the real world, yes, and so <laughs> we're, we're all in this together. But also on the positive side, we've seen prosecutions and indictments related to Syria. We've seen the Iranian president declining to go to the environmental summit in Scotland because five former victims filed case against him there. Although he might not be arrested, but also just having those people abstaining in these international forests where we feel some level of redress, the victims of all these regimes in the region, that gives us the hope to continue this fight. I thank you, May, for, for this discussion. I thank the World Movement for, for Democracy and NED and the Arab Reform Initiative. There's two, two topics we should have maybe touched on, the rise of non-state actors in the MENA region, which is very important, and how this sentiment of like we're locked in, in a bad system is contributing actually to some of the extremist narratives and this is how ISIS recruited some of this brutal, some of their brutal fighters to tell them you cannot survive within the system. Let's create our own. And this is clearly not to disagree with your remark, Yazan, but this is also one of the utilities of, of, of the uh, unfortunate disappointment by lots of the people in the region that we, we, we hit the wall. We don't have other options. So let's move maybe to another way of doing it, which is the, the violence. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. And I would also be remiss since you brought up EIPR if I if I didn't recognize the remarkable efforts by civil society inside Egypt and outside the country to mobilize at that moment of politicization. So I want to underscore that role as well. I think politics is part of it, but I think the role of civil society globally is an essential part of the story as well. And Yezan, you will get the last word before I conclude. Thank you very much, uh, Muhammad. Uh, I didn't I mean it. I, did, I didn't mean I, it anyway. <laughs> you saw the the link, but I, I want to say that I'm not I'm not offended because I think you are technically correct. Why are we leaving a gap for people to run to ISIS? Shouldn't we offer them the alternative if liberal democracies or you know any of these systems aren't working? Shouldn't we start giving them that gap? whether it takes into account radical action, whatever we're going to define radical action, why leave it to the ISIS's of the world, the nihilists? And this brings me to my point where I am hopeful, regardless of my negativity. I'm a pessimist optimist, ultimately. Uh, uh, it will all work out in the end. The road to the end is a disaster. And I do have hope in the sense of it's always hope in the next generation because we constantly leave them in a world that seems worse off than the previous. Therefore, out of urgency, they will fight back. And I have that hope on that human instinct of resistance, you know, to always push back, to always say no in the face of, you know, oppression and, and misinformation. It's uh, not, to, not to use a cliche, but I, I'll, I'll say it. There is always someone that is going to say that two plus two equals four, not five. And that is important. And that is my hope. And it's always the next generation that does that for us. So I think I'll leave it there. Thank you, Yazan. As we come up um, just a few minutes over our, our time, I want to again iterate my gratitude to our panelists today. Yasmin, Emna, Yazan, Hamad. It was a pleasure hearing your insights and reflections, sharing this with you learn, I know we only scratched this such an important topic, but I'm walking a lot to think about on the complexity of accountability, on how it means different things to different people, on what it means to realize accountability and how this is a path that's ever evolving and we never just reach the end. 
there's so much there on how we can better connect across the region and what it means to mobilize for a more just future. So I thank you for that. To our audience, thank you for your engaging questions. To Isam Iskandar, thank you for translating today's conversation and ensuring accessibility, the importance of, of us remaining accessible and using a language that everyone speaks in. And to the Time Up team, which made this event possible, particularly my colleague, Audrey Bolas, thank you for your efforts. And of course, to the World Movement for Democracy, it was a pleasure working alongside you to make this event possible. In the next few days, we will release a recording of today's event. I hope you're able to share it, engage with it, reflect on it. And I also invite you, audience members and panelists, to stay tuned for the upcoming events that will be hosted in this series by our colleagues at POMED and ARI. Thank you all, and I wish you all the best. Thank you, goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, goodbye.